Right, here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. My name's Sarah Hurley, Chief Dental Officer for England. Sarah, not Sarah. I'm speaking to you this afternoon from Skipton House, the uh, nerve centre of NHS England's nerve centre national challenge that COVID-19 is facing all of us, public, patients and professionals alike. Whilst it might be a somewhat hackney phrase, we are absolutely living and working in unprecedented times. We're facing a range of healthcare and public health challenges. Interesting shot with all the background out of focus. By those members of the profession that have fulfilled their responsibilities as true role models and clinical leaders in their communities. They've represented the talents of the profession and many of them stepping into a range of new roles, yep. drawing yep. on their talents, knowledge and experience. Yep. Indeed, I've seen that here in NHS England, where members of the OCDO team have been pulled into OCDO. a range of activities across healthcare. Again, drawing. You'd think you'd avoid using initialisms, wouldn't you? The OCDO. I don't know what OCDO is, unless it's obsessive consult, and indeed, pulsive disorders. The, themselves. the dental workforce in the United Kingdom consti 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 constitutes over 33,000 dentists. 33,000. 58,000 DCP registered. 58,000. So 91,000 people. Now, with a shift from the delay into the delay phase, from the containment phase. We have taken the unprecedented step of cessation of routine dental care. Yeah, ridiculous. This was not a step that we took easily. And the step was driven by the government decision for us to limit all but essential travel. We've worked with... So the dentistry is safe, it's just the travel. The CDOs across the four nations, the range of public health experts and we're, out, we're tied in to what is called SAGE and Nerve Tag, who give us the evidence, the scientific basis SAGE and Nerve the Tag. And the information and the guidance SAGE, I think, is the scientific the advisory group on something. It's been a difficult three to four Nerve weeks. Tag must be what gets on my nerves. Try to get information out. The pace of things moves so quickly that once we've written a document and it sits in its, its pile ready to go through the clearance process, we are often overmatched on occasions with the pace of change and new direction. That must be really Clearly frustrating for a bureaucrat. Line. And it is on the front line that we'll be asking our colleagues in the dental profession to consider and indeed we expect and welcome your skills and the transfer and talent to support our healthcare colleagues delivering in the acute care sector or yeah. community well, that's care good. sector that's good, or but indeed Doing what we do you're best. paying them full well, whack you're care. paying them full wages care hubs, so i suppose you've got to tell them to do something more of that to follow okay i have with me today a range of individuals that are going to talk through the issues which i know have created chatter on the twitter sphere myth and misunderstanding and misdirection from some individuals who hide behind the anonymous web page and the screen. I have to say, and it cannot go mm. unnoticed, that the examples of malicious use of the internet have not helped patient care. Most recently, a database of volunteers that was put up on the web, which breaches all levels of GDPR data control and has been reported to the Chief Information Officer for his consideration, has now been taken down. I urge anyone that is thinking about volunteering, and we'll put the website up at the end, to go to the official... Yeah, I wonder how malicious that was. Workforce survey Someone, results. some well-meaning person anyone started gathering names... Unwittingly being drawn into... ...from people who want to volunteer. ...base of volunteers... That is so they're going to be thrown under the bus. I ask you to consider whether your data was safe, and more importantly, now put it where it will be safe and can be used in order to put you and match you with the right organisation that can use your talent transfer. There has also been a second letter set out on the Dentist for Dentists Facebook. Again, it might have been someone's idea of an April Fool's joke, but we have tracked down the individuals to a dental practice in West Sussex and the details have been... I can't believe this. It, she's got up to 90,000 people watching her wanting to know what's going on. Things likely with the patients and she's decided to speak to one person we have no in, in a sort of a very school mistress 
type way, you know, sort of you. I can see you at the back there, Jenkins, you know. Don't think we have noticed what you're up to. And the mischievous activities of but, the but this lecturing, hectoring sort of uh, I know that the majority introduction the is just uh, of people are out there doing is the pointless. Thing we don't need to know very, this. Very difficult circumstances. We absolutely understand that it's not just about your work life. It's about the social life. It's about the community in which you work in. The multi-skilled community you in which you work want in. to be able to use your skills across healthcare. And in using skills across healthcare, I have with me today Sandra White from Public Health England, Matt Nelligan from NHS England, Sana, who has been very generously loaned into us by Health Education England, Eric, the Deputy CDO. We have Linda Dempster, who is the Infection Protection Control Lead for NHS England. And we have Gavin Wilson from CQC, a clinical fellow, a wet fingered clinical fellow. We are, <laughs> in other words, someone and knows what a mirror and probe is. is. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And we will go through a number of the issues which I know have been raised in questions, both online and into my email box. So where are we in the challenge? The challenge with the delay phase means that we have to step up and support NHS England in a range of new locations. My email box. My, Those will be uh, uh, but your inbox. But whilst we're redeploying, people are also thinking about how they are going to deal with the information about furloughed staff, about practices, the one twelfth uh, cont cont continuity payment from NHS England. Now, as I've emphasised before, my role is to look at the clinical policy and the quality benchmark. The quantity of what is commissioned is a regional and NHS based decision as is the contract and the contract conditions, your terms and conditions of service, fall to NHS England. We work in partnership and I know many of you have been working in partnership. That's interesting with because it seems like she's trying to local, uh, offload uh, the, to the responsibility to NHS England for and hubs. a fair bit of what dentists are upset about. That actually me talking about the redeployment isn't really the key issue and I have agreed with Matt to hand over with to him for us to now look at some of the key issues about finance and where we go next. So we're looking at a number of questions that are popping up and Matt can see these too. And what we're going to use is use this as a narrative theme to ask these questions and hopefully allay fears um, and put some of those myths to rest. So Matt, are you on the line please? Hi, can Thanks, everyone Matt. hear me? Yes, Matt, Hi, you're on. This is Matt Nelligan. Um, I am Director of Primary Care and System Transformation in NHS England and NHS Improvement. And thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, really That's amazing. His business um, card must be 12 I'd inches wide. I'd like to reiterate uh, my thanks for, um, as, as you say, Sarah, this is an unprecedented um, incident in our lifetime. And it's just been hugely impressive and immensely appreciated the extent to which the NHS um, has started to rise to that, um, started to rise to that challenge. In order to help that, um, we're working to get, get information um, out. Um, I'd like to thank you for your forbearance um, with that. I'd have liked to get information out more quickly and more clearly for people. That's interesting because they don't operate really have a channel of communication with dentists. Said it's been a really fast moving um, incident that's presented its challenges, but we're absolutely committed to working constructively. They do, there's no sort of way, uh, they don't have all the dentist emails or the practice emails or anything. There's no uh, channel of communication that they can push information down. So in, a, in approaching that and in, appro in ensuring that we get clear information on uh, contracts and payments and the commissioning position, um, we need to organise our priorities. So the, so the plans have to be clear on patient safety first and foremost. 
then making sure that we've got services. The priority seems to be making sure that the payments are sorted out. I thought they'd actually kick off with how the patients are cared for. Organised into those, but it seems like safely operate. And then that we've got the thing that they're going to go off with first is support all of the range of patients' services. Is to reinsure NHS dentists that they're the most they're still going to get paid. Three letters out that have started this process, and the most recent letter on the. 25th of March that Sarah and I published um, aimed to do um, exactly that with a number of principles behind these are the uh, behind what we're so-called preparedness letters they're online the chief the dental officers uh, preparedness uh, letters they're very very light on detail of, um, of how we describe them and uh, they're not sent to anyone you're uh, just uh, hopefully someone um, tells you there's another one some of the issues that another one's been published you know you have to check every day to see if there's a new one I'll pick out some big themes there which hopefully um, start to address a number of the 814, 820 going up every second questions that we've already um, that we've already received from people on this um, webinar. Um, so the principles are for payment for activity in 2019-20. We recognise March was an unusual month because of March this year was an unusual month because of the disruption. So our proposal was to. Um, to effectively slip the payment for 2019-20 back by a month and to look at the year from March 2019 to February 2020 as being the year on which we'd uh, conduct the final uh, reconciliation um, on contracts for, um, for that financial year. And I'll, I'll come back to some of the questions um, on that. Then for 2020-21, um, we wanted to work to the principles of um, being able to make sure we were maintaining cash flow to practices, um, being able to support an arrangement where staff who, in the context of the suspension of routine dental care that Sarah described, um, that we were able to support staff to be made um, available to support the wider um, NHS response. So both to be able to offer their services into um, urgent dental care um, systems um, that we would establish across the country. Um, or to be able to offer their capacity. Okay, so uh, what he said is that the, in the last year, because uh, they um, dentists have had 11 good months and one rubbish one, March 2020, that they're going to uh, measure, move the goalposts uh, one month to the left. Or um, in other, across other parts of the across other parts of the country. So making sure that we're able to support staff to become. A and then even and though dentists aren't working and their NHS staff, and he's only talking about NHS dentists. Here. NHS dentists and their staff aren't working. To design the, the NHS uh, England is going to carry on paying them so that they can then volunteer to work in places like the, the um, Nightingale centres. How many will? Those were the principles that we. Is anybody's guess? We published in the letter um, last week what we would do in that respect. So cash flow wise, to continue to make monthly payments equal to a twelfth of um, annual contract values, um, and then on um, how we make that workable for staff to be released. Still, some detail um, to be um, worked through on. Yeah, that's but that is the Department of Health all over. That is, they don't support, worry about the um, problems that make uh, the thing contract impossible being assumed to be maintained at a level that allows continued employment of staff, despite the fact that we know that actual activity, of course, will be um, of course will be reduced during this period, and in return for the certainty around continued payment. Um, requiring practices to make staff available for the wider um, unbelievable response. ensuring that a, a dentist who's and he's going to get level no penalty for doing 11 months um, work in 12 because they've moved the goalposts and only do one month these unusual arrangements and for fixed period now if he volunteers at the qe center he's going to be the best paid worker there because he's still earning how we his money as a dentist um, and uh, committed, you know, to, uh, to uh, doing, doing more information, not even having to do something with, else, um, just being BDA asked if it, uh, if he wouldn't mind considering volunteering to the sector. So we know it's not perfect, and we know that we're part way through agreeing yeah. that uh, process, and there are a number of issues. You can there. say that again. We'll be looking to address these in a letter that we put out um, early next week. So we'll put out our fourth letter. 
um, early next week that gives some clarity on some of those issues. And what I'll just do now is spend um, a couple of minutes on some of the big headlines that we've heard from people and the, the big concerns that we've had. So the first uh, relates to um, the 2019-20 arrangements taking activity. From You'll notice he's, he's going to persist with the money. The baseline. We know that, that the BBC wants to know where are all the dentists, example, the, how are people um, being was opened after looked after if they've got toothache. Or but where not, not these uh, guys. Mark these guys are all about unusually contract payments activity and, and Mark activity and dates. Higher. Those those kind of issues can be worked through with um, with local uh, commissioners. And I would expect and we've given a message to all of our regional commissioners that we'd expect a fair, sensible and proportionate approach to be um, to be taken there. The default position is it's March 2019 to 2020 to, to February 2020. Um, but we will, you know, the application of common sense um, will uh, take precedence there. The next big issue that's been raised, uh, that's been raised has been around where practices have a mix of NHS and private provision. So as part of um, the guarantee around continuing funding, and making staff available into um, in, to support the COVID response, we um, we made a statement that um, because we're providing support through NHS funding, that would mean that um, practices shouldn't be applying for other government support. Um, the intention there was, and um, I, I thought this was clear, and it, it clearly wasn't in the wording, that that should apply to the NHS proportion of businesses only. So we um, will produce a really clear statement on that in the letter that comes out next week. This is week. because of the confusion um, over the, 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 the practice that's half NHS and half private. NHS proportion of and he's practice. still getting all their NHS income. Obviously really important. Uh, whether they can um, uh, furlough their staff the, in, in effect for the other 50% of the staff's wages. Is to make sensible arrangements around organising their, their business. I presume they mean 50% by turnover and not 50% um, by patient numbers because the most third, um, big theme that we've heard in practices are 50 um, has been around um, redeployment of their 50% by income, but much less than 50% by patient numbers. of having a contract that pays for units of activity and staff who are self-employed and do a mix of NHS and, provide, uh, and private work, how we can ensure that we're appropriately able to remun remunerate staff um, on the continuity basis through the funding that we're providing through the NHS, but also freeing them up to be able to provide their services to the new Nightingale hospitals. And, and you know, as Sarah's described, we've been overwhelmed by the appetite and ambition and enthusiasm with which people have uh, wanted to approach this. And we've, we've got to get those arrangements right. We're still working on providing a clear position, a clear workable position. Again, trying to look at, you know, in this fast moving environment, pragmatism, a sensible and fair approach and something that's really, uh, really workable there and looking to provide clarity on um, on that. So that's still working um, in progress. The fourth uh, big theme we've had is around how will you EA claims um, operate uh, in this period when we're suspending remote uh, uh, um, routine dental um, activity. So for remote triage that we've asked practices to set up, there is no expectation of um, UDA claims being made um, there, but we do want to um, ensure that some capture of the um, activity is going to take place. We'll he, he's going to talk about um, that in our next letter. bureaucracy now and um, just how the, the bin counting, you know, how they can uh, takes place. try and um, we are force um, people to record that, um, how many people have rung up for antibiotics, etc. We want to make sure again that we're um, putting in place fair arrangements. But we're still, I mean, what are we now? We're about a third of the way through the webinar and nobody's um, mentioned anything about what to do with the patients who've got to do Dental care, of course. Um, and then the fifth big theme is big, people have asked about what are the practical steps that should be taken now? So there's um, four big things um, to, uh, to pick out here. So the establishment of urgent dental care systems, getting involved in the conversations with commissioners and uh, with LDCs. Now that's interesting because these look like. We'll come back to these urgent de uh, dental care centres between practices and between other. But he's quite systems. clear there that they are the responsibility uh, of commissioners, staff, and ensuring that staff are ready to be available for redeployment. 
um, and establishing telephone triage and remote consultation um, arrangements for providing advice um, over the phone or online if that's um, or online if that's possible um, and having a proper discussion with commissioners around agreeing what those are what those arrangements are so those are the sort of practical um, next steps that we're encouraging um, practices to take I will stop talking I'm really keen in the questions that we hear what else um, people want to hear about um, yeah what, what do you do when a patient rings you we're going to look who's got two things through, um, through further guidance we're going to bundle things up into um, into themes um, I'm sure we were if there's no every question local this urgent this dental webinar, care center in your area our absolute commitment to you how does that um, patient get treated we will listen to all of those questions and all of the uh, concerns and we will work constructively with you to agree fair and sensible and workable arrangements that allow us to provide appropriate and high quality care oh, i think the arrangements are more than fair circumstances so thank then you just get a month all for your commitment it's really income for, for not working for a month and by the wider team and then they carry on getting their monthly income even though they're not we'll doing dentistry they might talking might just be sitting at home back, so thank you. what he hasn't clarified is that if a dentist is commissioned let's say to do a thousand dental units of treatment and he spends the first three months sitting at home is he going to be expected Are still to do the thousand? Just come off mute. Oh, this is, oh, this is painful. Yeah. So the activity. How are they going to make the activity up? If they volunteer down the Nightingale Hospital and and yeah. uh, till the July, are they going to be expected to Sorry, do twelve months worth of units in in nine months, or are they going to be just? Uh, expected to do nine yeah it's not on mute on my phone and i've done fast technical rehearsal that's the answer to this so the computer's telling us we're unmuted i'm hoping you can hear us fantastic so thanks very much matt there um there are clearly and i'm just looking at it 1000 we're now coming up for 1500 questions yeah you're obviously um, clarifying things so folks a while to run through all those questions we're clearly not going to do that in this event but what i can tell you is that we will now cross reference and put those into themes however many of those questions are already answerable in the work work that we put out previously in the uh, innovative documents that had all the live links uh, which are included also in the letters. Um, I think you remember from my letter to the BDA, which was littered with the hyperlinks to the SOPs. Um, we are utilising the standard operating procedures, moving um, environment, and therefore when PHE update a website or CFP Public Health England a website or NHS England updates the website, that's why we asked you to um, hyperlink and bookmark. Uh, so you'd be able to maintain a, a regular update. Yeah. Pull. We, we have to pull the information also down. Make the links into your dental leads. Those are the individuals. You could push the information to us you if you tried. Best. That's so the that's what, what, what I'd expect. Your first port of call for but no, we have to. I have to keep pressing refresh your on your website. Your regional lead is unable to give you the question. Then your regional lead will be pulling those questions and the common themes. I don't have a regional lead. Center to Matt, Carol, and ourselves for us to be able to provide a clear direction that then is common across the country. We want to avoid postcode lottery for care and patients and postcode lottery for provisioner, uh, providers. Now, we've got a number of questions about private practice. That is not the, um, the theme that we're on today. And many of those private practice issues are actually for the Department of Health to address. Many of these are BDA members. I would urge you to use your mm. professional negotiating body to take these issues about um, retention in the profession for therapists and associates with private commitments, uh, questions about how private dental practice we help financially. But there's one interesting question here about could a private provider provide emergency uh, care or with the NHS? The issue here is an NHS performer list number is required. And more importantly, we have sufficient numbers of NHS performer list providers who have already volunteered to deliver for the NHS. So for those of you are a, a private or an almost exclusively private practice that want to contribute, I then direct you to the dental survey on the NHS list, uh, NHS website, 
where you can volunteer your um, skills and your talents to transfer perhaps to work in the community or into the, um, the acute care setting. And that is the piece of work that SANA has been leading for us in developing the redeployment. The I think that's interesting because that is a fundamental shift. See, and when I was so um, use that as a, segue to our sauna to a young practitioner, the chief dental officer was uh, the head of the profession. There was no real distinction between community dental, NHS, private, etc. She was like, or he, he was the, the top dentist. But now, um, I think what's happened is she's made that quite clear that she's well, she washes her hands of the private sector. She doesn't want to know anything about it. She doesn't have anything to say about it. Um, she hasn't considered it. So basically, you, you know, you're on your own. Skills that they have to help with the COVID crisis. I might fast forward through this there because this is about um, uh, skills that the how to volunteer has and the framework and guidance that we've put together uh, is which is not that I don't it's not that I don't think dentists should volunteer I'm I'm all in favour of dentists volunteering let's face it they're getting paid within the dental workforce 90 100,000 pounds uh, yeah. they could do a bit of volunteering uh, skills that can be used in uh, other healthcare systems. but um this is a bit too or both those dental workforce members needy, you know, it's a bit like oh, we can we can talk to we patients, you know, we can do um, we've had fantastic we can stick needles in and we can do contributions from all major organizations. We can take blood. This guidance I think we're trying too hard at this point to be the together. doctors, you know. Well, like, there are, well, like the pharmacists in Sainsbury's who goes on about how important pharmacists are. And, uh, use and redeploy their skills we have got a lot of skills that's true and nobody ever bothers to redeploy them determined locally and individually like for example with the nhs 111 they're very short of people to do um telephone triage it would be for them to decide how they would but use um, this what they want is uh, doctors to date we've had thirteen thousand people from the dental workforce who have shown a willingness willingness uh, and they're not to, uh, uh, they want doctors who can volunteer to triage in the day. I mean, that's a job that a dentist could easily do because we've, you know, we have the clinical skills to diagnose this. We can talk to the patients and things like that. And at the end of the day, you're only following a script. And plenty of non-medically qualified staff work for 111. So if I was looking for people to man 111, which can be done remotely as well, um, with minimal training, I would look at the dental workforce. Uh, especially as we're all, we're all free in the day. You know, where none of us is doing anything now in the day. Around, for example, indemnity, around... Remuneration you know, around. What, we're we're um, going to try and go along what to the do the COVID hospitals and act uh, like doctors when in fact we could be redeployed quite questions. well as call handlers. The underlying and uh, at a time when they really want sure that it's safe volunteers, which is people during are day hours, to the limits of the usual competency, but might have to work in different teams. Um, and in a different sort of a hierarchical setting. I think I might fast forward through Sana because um, she's a lovely the woman by the look of her. But map to specific um, roles, boring. and we understand that there will be an absolute need for induction, for training, for orientation to be able to work safely in new settings, and that's a fundamental part of the guidance and the framework. And again, we've worked with other organisations such as uh, Health Education England have provided online uh, training modules have ha as have other organizations to ensure that that induction that orientation can be provided to uh, those members of the dental workforce who've shown a willingness uh, to be redeployed we recognize that it's important that dental members shouldn't be removed from roles which would leave uh, urgent dental services understaffed and that's again a key part of the guidance and also that the hospital dental workforce uh, should put themselves firstly at the disposal of their trust the medical director for redeployment as and similarly for the academic dentists um, and that there is a need for well-being for support for any member of the dental workforce who uh, 
is redeployed. So, I mean, that's there's been an a, amazing amount of work. And of course, all this is not unique to the dental service. We've seen this for um, pharmacists. We've seen this for physiotherapists. We've seen this for doctors, orthopedic surgeons, where we're no longer doing hip operations. Um, what's been really interesting and exciting is the combination across the Royal Colleges and more importantly, our relationship now with the National Clinical Director for Critical Care, who I know Gavin has been working alongside in order to produce how are we going to use these skills. We are head and neck specialists. We can prescribe control drugs. We can place a Benflon. We can maintain an airway. Uh, we have a, an ability to be able to monitor patients, to take clinical records. So Gavin, tell me what you've agreed with the Royal Colleges and where this is going to take us. Uh, excuse the movement of the, um, the side. This is social isolation at its best. So hi, everyone. Um, just, just to sort of emphasise what, what Sana has has already mentioned, um, this is a great opportunity for uh, for us as the dental profession to to stand up to the plate and and help and provide, you know, our care and effective quality safe care w when it is most need most at need. And so we have, as Sana has already alluded to, communicated with the National Clinical Director of Critical Care of of A and E, of primary care and general practice and have compiled a table of, of suitable tasks and roles of which all members of the dental team should be able to contribute to. And so that can include things such as cannulation, airway management, phlebotomy, and maybe some roles that, that, that we wouldn't ordinarily be involved in, such as supporting critically ill patients, communicating with family and relatives, which, which, we, which we are all excellent at. Um, and so this is quite an extensive list that I believe is, is matched quite well to, to the competencies of our team. And I think really just to re-emphasise the importance of utilising all members of the team. So this includes dentists, dental nurses, dental hygienists and therapists. So no one will be left out and everyone has that great opportunity to shine. Thanks, Kevin. I mean, for me, this could be the dream that Millie Doshi had to really get mouth care matters into the critical care units. If you've got a bed buddy that happens to be a fully qualified dentist, hygienist, therapist or dental nurse, actually, you know, dare I say it, we're putting the mouth back into the COVID-19 challenge here. Um, and I think the opportunity to raise the awareness of all our healthcare colleagues by this important part. So thank you. But as Sana said, one of the pivotal pieces here is making sure that we do retain sufficient staff members and the dental team across the various sites, both hospital and out in community, providing urgent dental care. Now, in our last letter, we, um, we, we directed, uh, slightly more than asked, but we directed that all routine dental care should stop. Right, here we go. We also asked practices to ensure that they continue to offer telephone triage advice and giving prescriptions where necessary. Now, clearly, many of you may find that that was not sufficient That's a, to actually a terrible, the patient terrible need clinical further approach. active emergency treatment. Across the regions, there was already a pandemic a contingency plan, and I know that that was put into place by a number of the regions. However, COVID taking its toll as it has in a number of areas meant that full activation of that service has not happened as quickly and as rapidly as we expected. Who'd have thought that? Also, there are different challenges to COVID. A pandemic. A pandemic influenza. Causing COVID. problems implementing a pandemic so plan. And we do see in the interim, whilst urgent dental, urgent dental care centres may not be available in all areas and patient management by advice, analgesics and anti antibiotics is the preferred, mm -hmm. that we recognise that some prof professionals will feel the need yeah. to treat patients and they should use their clinical judgment if there is no urgent dental care service available that meets the needs of their okay. patients in that locality. Excellent. The default settings, I said, is always the three A's. But if you have to seek urgent dental care or treatment, it's Ace, advice, antibiotics, the analgesia. Was to guard the current guidance. But First no LUDC. Population risk of virus transmission. That means reducing the need to travel. You can if see the patient. You can treat the patient. Then we, it will be for a non aerosol generating procedure. So no crowns. You expect the the bridges PPE, which is a. Um, the fluid resistant surgical mask yep. that we normally use, yep. plus a visor, as normal we stuff in the last letter. Yep. Normal stuff. Gloves, apron. Normal stuff. I say full avoidance of an aerosol generating procedure. Yep. 
CQC have said in these circumstances that they will be seeking assurances that the provider is delivering a self and well-led care. But what you are doing there is responding to a patient's requirement under the public health acknowledgement that we have issues in travel, but also there has been a limit in the service standing up locally. Yeah, so However, no local urgent dental care centre. And I have seen for myself that you can treat the patient. Of our local dental network chairs and their providers locally to set up the urgent care centres. Yeah. The urgent care centres are, are, as I say, designated by your NHS region. And in designating those regions, there will be clarity on what is expected to be delivered in those centres, how it links to NHS 111, and how uh, practitioners can direct patients for a further assessment. Now, clearly, there will still be some patients where the three A's and the PP and the, aeros the non aerosol generating procedure is still unsatisfactory in terms of meeting their healthcare needs. Therefore, we have and will be designating those sites and those providers that can provide aerosol generating procedures for emergency dental care. That will require providers and the team to take the necessary precautions, including the wearing of an FFP full, a full, mask. Yeah, a full workup, a full mask. And everything. mask yeah. is only useful if it's been fit tested. And the fit testing okay. is she's, being she's going off on a, She's going to go off on a rant about public health don't use a mask area. unless someone else has so checked it. So buy an FFP3 mask so, um, off the internet. Um, I think because her biggest problem is that dentists are going to say that there is no local urgent de dental care centre. So I, have so really I am going to carry on seeing my patients, including Crowns, Bridges, etc. And they're and going to use a full uh, N95 mask and everything. Now the expert, but she's basically saying, uh, don't the try that. Of our you know, don't approach don't try regions. that one on. And working with the regions is Eric. So I'm going to ask Eric to come on. But that's quite, that, I mean, that, I thought that that was quite clear. She's having no LUDC. For our you can, if you need to, you can treat the patients, providing you don't uh, I am sorry. generate an aerosol. Um, so I think we all realize. Eric, you're in the Grand Canyon, Eric. A fortnight ago or so, the whole world uh, changed. Uh, both for our professional lives and also... But there's still no um, liaison with the private sector. I mean, my question is, uh, social distancing if I triage a patient and I give them antibiotics and they still need a tooth out, routine care and the how do I... Do I refer them to an LUDC if there's one locally? Or if there isn't one locally, then it's OK for me to do the extraction, providing I don't... And uh, I think I would echo what Sarah has said about... You, you, you are echoing. In the local regional yeah, so I can, do I send them to an LUDC? So there's no LDUC, then I can do the treatment providing I don't generate an aerosol. I think that's that's fairly clear. And I'm reasonably happy with that. So it's urgent treatment, non-aerosol non generating, no LUDC, get on with it. Using just the normal, the normal get up, dental get up, mask, gloves, uh, apron, visor. That need care. Um, what we're uh, working on now, and what I suppose I'd like to do, is, is just give a little bit of a heads up around our standard uh, operating procedures. Um, we have divided um, our uh, standard oper operating procedure that we hope to um, publish, as Matt said earlier on, uh, a letter early next week, um, uh, a standard operating procedure alongside that, um, which is covering, first of all, the system, um, and then the uh, service providers within the system. Um, in terms of the, the system, it's very much about the, uh, the principles of what a system needs to uh, look like, what the, uh, the system needs to provide. Um, we can't be uh, prescriptive in terms of exactly how you should set that up because we know that the solution to this in London will be very different to the solution. In I think the trouble is that they are being prescriptive. Based part of the country for By prescribing the system, effectively you're prescribing uh, what, 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 what is provided. Dental hospitals, and they can't areas, let go of this uh, centralised, top-down, command and control so type approach. It's a, it's a hopeless bureaucracy. It's all directed from Skipton House. And it is about... 
and everybody looks up to know what to do. You know, it's like the Russian army. Primary care, general. You can't do anything without permission from the guy who's above you. Services and even in its most uh, acute form, obviously, uh, A and E for um, swellings, which might be um, encroaching on the on the airway. So it really is about flexibility, and it's about um, people working together, as I know they already are. The second part of the uh, standard operating procedure is uh, related to the actual service delivery itself. And again, in relation to um, particularly the, the uh, estate, estate aspects of this, there's got to be a degree of, of variability in terms of who contributes and how exactly uh, the service is, is configured uh, locally. Um, Back the, to money budgets. Covers the two stages effectively of the, the pathway. First stage being the uh, remote stage, um, which Sarah has, has described already in terms of risk assessing the patients and then um, the, the three A's type approach. And then the second element of the, of the service description is associated with the uh, face-to-face uh, management uh, aspect. And again, there are a number of different ways of achieving um, that face-to-face -face approach for uh, patients in your locality. And it will very much depend upon what resources uh, are available uh, to be able to bring that together in terms of the different uh, types of, of providers. Um, as well as those principles... It's worthwhile um, in reminding ourselves he's not talking to the uh, dentist here, he's talking to the, um, the commissioners. Uh, to the SOP a number of uh, appendices. There are some, uh, one, a number of appendices which are, are, are related to um, the, the links that we have with um, FDS and uh, the Faculty of General Dental Practice. Um, we are going to uh, point to those via uh, web links across to some work that they've been doing with us to take a look at existing guidelines and pathways that they have for the uh, dental specialties and so my worry is by the time they've example, gone to the library and um, dusted off all the old pathways and guidelines some guidance uh, in the, the covid thing will be over uh, where um, we we have these uh, conditions which are which are unusual um, so we're grateful to them for their help and support <laughs> the funniest thing i think is the pandemic plan guidance fell apart because everybody was there. sick the that's, appendices cover that's a classic uh, shielded patients. You will have he heard about this in the uh, on, on the news, and, and we'll know about it from our, our letters and other correspondence. The importance of keeping people who have um, medical conditions, which are means that they are Im immunocompromised, or there are other issues associated with their care, maybe having cancer treatment, etc. Mm -hmm. Which means that if they contract uh, COVID, COVID, then, then the, consequences the consequences are very are very, uh, are very uh, serious. So I think um, we, we, we have um, a, an appendix uh, which is related specifically to uh, dealing with the, the shielded patients. We have an appendix which covers the broad patient pathways that we would like people to uh, follow, respecting that they will in their operation be slightly different um, uh, at a local level in terms of exactly how things are configured. Uh, we have um, a remote prescribing uh, protocol um, and we have uh, uh, an appendix uh, which covers the considerations for uh, uh, analgesia and appropriate analgesia in the circumstances. We also have a, a substantial appendix related to infection prevention control and we all know that yesterday um, the revised guidelines, um, the four UK health protection uh, agencies revised guidelines on uh, infection prevention control were were published, uh, and obviously that's a, a really really important part of of, of the SA, SOP and helps people now to be able to nail down. Uh, well, I think one of the things that what their, stri uh, their strikes me is this aerosol uh, issue because. Be. So I think that gives. Um, you know, we, it's not the first time it's come up we have, in uh, coming up previous the, breakouts uh, of various diseases, and, and people have, people we've, we've considered aerosol generating procedures and 
always come to the conclusion that the measures we take are adequate because um, any one of our patients could have anything. You know, could, a patient could walk in with Ebola, SARS or MERS or foot and mouth, H1N1, any, anything at any time. Um, for some reason, if we don't know that they might be sick, then it's okay. But the minute we do know that they, they might be sick, um, it's lockdown. So thanks, uh, Eric, our Deputy CDO. I'm hoping that you've got sound and vision now. We had a bit of a disconnect there, so if someone can give me a thumbs up if they heard me. No. Yeah, you didn't, Lovely. Okay. you didn't press the button. So, so uh, Eric, our Deputy CDO, just to clarify. Sarah, sorry, Sarah. No one should be providing face-to-face -face treatment for patients unless what? they're in a designated, regionally authorised UDC hub spoke centre, if yes. that makes sense. Unless one doesn't exist. We recognise that there has been an interim period where individuals felt that they needed to do something, but with all the hubs now up and running, ah, no this is a, anyone to open their practice. Advice is changing on the hoof. I say, unless they're a designated practice okay. on UDC. So now, things are updating so practice, fast that in the 30 minutes, the telephone. Now, in, that's through, in the 15 that's minutes, <laughs> This um, webinar's been going. Ensuring a 24 /7 She's gone from right saying, if there is no LUDC, you can see the patients. Uh, for your patients, that is something that I, am, I could absolutely... To saying that you absolutely can't, can't see your patients to unless to you're in an LUDC. To do that. And that there are plenty of LUDCs. So, if we have so there's no problem. UDC well. going on out there. And we have got both aerosol generating and non-aerosol generating uh uh, procedures that is going to require some clear guidance on PPE and yesterday Public Health England uh, in conjunction with the four CMOs and four See, I think the reason why she public, looks so stressed um, is because she guidance and direction for the thinks use of that she's and the only person that can think here, and I know we may have Sandra on the line as well from Public Health England so, so and that everybody needs guidance we're all idiots NHS England. Not like one of us can the understand the situation uh, that has been given and so we need Sandra we need guidance amplify as required and so she's stressed because she's being you. called upon okay, to give thank you. Hello, my so much you. guidance so quickly um, as Sarah's just said we did publish yesterday she's a bit guidance down that applies across the whole of primary and secondary care and even into, um, you know, home carers. So it's a clear, consistent guidance. And the thing that was really important about that document, it has aligned the PPE, the personal protective equipment. So it's very clear what everybody should be wearing, whatever setting. I'm going to fast forward in. through this because um, basically she's just stress enough that she's just no going to describe PPE um, if you're not actually undertaking the other what, basics in uh, um, infection prevention. Protective, personal protective equipment you need. Specialists will know how important hand hygiene is and also the cleaning of the environment must be to a very high level. So I, I don't need to tell you that. And so we would obviously be wearing, um, if we were only undertaking uh, a non-aerosol generating procedure, the PPE that you wear regularly as part of your day-to-day -day work, a fluid-resistant surgical face mask, you would have disposable gloves, an apron, <coughs> and some form of eye protection. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what the, the change in the, the guidance that came out made it clear as well that you can actually wear the eye protection and the face mask um, for a session or a duration, not having to change between um, every patient. So that was a change in the guidance. You would obviously change it if that became damaged or soiled in any way. But if you were going to be undertaking an aerosol generating procedure, you do need to wear the FFP3 respirator. And again, it's really, really important to stress what Zara's already said. There's no point wearing one if you've not been fit tested. A poorly fitting one will give you a false sense of security about protection to yourself. So you do need to be fit tested. And I understand from Eric there are some processes in place now working with the dental public health teams and colleagues across to make sure that that training is being undertaken, the fit testing, in areas that will be undertaking these procedures. So in the table two in that guidance, I know everyone's not going to read the whole guidance, but there is a very clear table, table two, that explains what PPE you need to wear and when you need to wear it. So that's the highlights realistically. Thank you. So I'm hoping I'm back online again. I was rather hoping so, you weren't. Uh, Sandra, there again has been a, 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 a number of issues about the non-aerosol and aerosol generating procedures. And I think we've been very clear 
the default setting time and time again during this delay phase, and I have to keep reiterating is remote consultation is the is the primary mode of providing patient support. If a patient does need face to face, it's got to be in a designated centre and the default at that stage unless there's no center if you have to move to giving an intervention then you need to make sure that it should be a non aerosol generating procedure if you then absolutely have to go to an aerosol generating procedure then you need to think about why you're doing it what it's going to achieve and does it actually need to be done now so I, it, there is a sort of escalation in the care pathway now, there's been some discussion about, I say, what is an aerosol generating procedure? And I think we, 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 we are getting quite confused about the concept of aerosol, airborne and droplet. Sandra, I just wondered whether you might just help come in and clarify to us some of the, the myths and help us dispel some of the myths rather on the aerosol, airborne and droplet dilemma. Thanks. Oh, no. They've got a dilemma, an, aer an aerosol <laughs> droplet dilemma. It doesn't okay, matter. Maybe not. She, she's gone home. I don't blame her. So I think one of the things that, being, that has been um, a consternation of individuals is when we were discussing um, things like the, the triple spray um, and the use of a triple spray. Clearly, we would have you would should avoid using um, a, a high pressure triple spray. You might want to be able to think about uh, creating. There's uh, no. A, there aren't a, different a, pressures on triple sprays. Water over the tooth surface. Water yeah. over the tooth surface they and just you press a button and that's the pressure it comes out at. Working at, at in unprecedented times, so we've got to think quite clearly about the the issues that we need to do. I think now I've just seen the thing is that she's the aerosols are generated by the dentist stronger. drill, the air rotor. Sandra, have you got back on the uh, line yet? No. So basically, the okay. problem is that the air rotor rotates so fast um, that it picks up aerosol generating procedures, uh, non -aerosol air and water and whips it up is contained into in an aerosol. The, um, the SOP. Um, Sandra, if you can hear me, it's a it's a star. It's not. It's helped by wearing a rubber a dam. But nobody in National Health Service uses a rubber dam. So basically, what she should be saying is you cannot use an air rotor. Yeah. We can, Sandra. Thank you. Hurrah. Hurrah. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Sandra, thank you're very quiet. Thank you very much, Sara. Um, Could you come a bit closer to the microphone, please? Safety, um, for, for staff. And I'm going to sort of steal this opportunity to recognise that it's, it's stately obvious, really, that it is an emotional time and people have family and friends and they want to keep safe. So that the guidance is there to try and keep staff safe as well as the patients. Um, and some of us, and as this is a novel guidance and things are changing the whole time, the guidance is updated to reflect the pandemic's evolution. Um, so at this time, of course, it, it, it has changed from where we were before, um, and we are in a period of widespread community transmission. So that's why there's the, in effect, now there's an assumption that all patients uh, present a risk. So. Um, I think in terms of the aerosol generating procedures, it, there are three ways of transmitting the virus. And I would encourage, you know, we've got, we're scientific, intelligent people, dentists. Please have a look at the guidance and read through about the transmission and the kind of virus it is, because I think you'll find it, if you haven't done it already, you probably have. But it is quite fascinating finding out some of the science behind it. But the, the three ways that you can, and I, I'm speaking, you know, te teaching my mother how to suck eggs here, but there's three ways you can catch it. One is by contact, touching people, touching surfaces. One's by droplet, so, um, you know, the, in terms of using splatter from the mouth. And the third way is the aerosols. But the aerosols have got uh, defined as being less than five micrometers. So they're very tiny particles. And in terms of what is accepted as an aerosol generating procedure, there is that that's an agreed, a committee agrees that um, and has to look at all of the different kind of concepts there are and, and, and all the procedures and try and work out what actually creates aerosol as opposed to splatter. And we've all squirted something in the mouth and, you know, our shields, our, our, our visors afterwards are covered in blood and saliva and all horrible sorts of stuff, but that's droplets, not Aerosols. So God, really how are you working? Those two. So aerosols, the kind of aerosols that are created in urgent dental care, so my urgent dental care here, not anything else, then that's your high speed drill. Someone's and breathing into the microphone. It's not me, by the way, just to, because, you know, you, in case you're wondering. Someone's left their mic turned on and they're doing a bit of heavy breathing. And the water together, then, you know, you can see that there's a mist created there. So 
the advice is really to um, avoid um, high, pre high, high speed drills whenever you can. If you have to use it, obviously use the FFP res respirators and all of the other things that are advised. Um, and then don't use anything else that, you, that, that can create an aerosol generating procedure. So Cavitron scalers, all of those things shouldn't be used anyway really for urgent care, but try and avoid those. Um, and there is more guidance coming out. Um, so basically what I said, the high speed drill. Coming out, there is also ongoing, if you looked at the evidence. But that doesn't really apply because, you know, that you, you need to be fully gowned up and to use the high speed drill. Oh, that, that's a specialist thing. We're not even, we don't even want that. We just want to be able to take the odd tooth out. Um, so I hope that's helpful, Sarah. I can speak about other things if you'd like me to. Thanks very much, Sandra. Um, we are now getting to the last four minutes. Um, Sandra, Sana, and Sara. This has been a multi-skilled, multidisciplinary endeavour uh, in supporting the. I think people workforce. are going to. We have tried. One, one of the things that I wonder as a dentist is why our universal cross infection control, uh, which is deemed to work for everything, you know, hepatitis, Ebola, everything, the, the AIDS, AIDS you know, into us everything, why all of a sudden it's so it's no good, it's useless. You know. A lot of the, the questions have actually, as I say, been very, there's been lots of repetition. And I think, um, I, I think I'd like to echo Sandra's, Sandra's piece here. The information is out there. One of the things that we did with the original SOP... A heavy breather's still sure breathing away, isn't he? You just put in the words COVID Dental England into the Google search engine. We'd arrange with Google that we would then come up in the top three. So the information was out there and it was quite easy to find. Um, I would encourage you to continue to do your search. First of all, at the NHS website where we put the letters of preparedness and we will continue to update the guidance. Um, I would encourage you not to listen to the to the myth masters on the social media. Um, we rely on evidence, not anecdote. We're an evidence based set of practitioners. I have to say that the BDA website is also a very, very un uh, informative. Source. Yeah, the, that's all right if you are a member of the BDA, but the, there are a very large um, number of dentists who aren't members of the BDA. Woodrow. So relying on the BDA to um, that we have put out there distribute and has information, provided I think a, is a very poor. For the profession. I think this should be coming out direct for those that are in private yeah. practice. We should have a channel of communication directly the, um, to the, the dentist that you purport and to I um, can again regulate. Assure you the four CDOs are working shoulder to shoulder. Whilst there are sometimes differences in the publication process, which means that something that can get through the, the Welsh government takes um, me a little bit longer to get it through NHS England, the Department of Health, and then out through the government process. It's not as necessary as slick as Scotland and Wales, but we are aligned and continue to be aligned. Just to let you know that with 10,397 people dialed into this webinar, I think we've set a record for NHS webinars. I'd like to also let you know that this is recorded and it will be posted on the NHS website. I'm not necessarily known for my brevity. I hope we've given you information, we've repeated the information and we've reinforced the information. And at 17.58... Don't forget, I'd like change to the information in the middle of the webinar as well. ...contributions to what they are doing in terms of the COVID challenge nationally. And for the team here at Skipton House, Leeds, and across the England and into Wales and Scotland, those doing the policy to make life safe for our patients, safe for you to be providing the care, and safe for you to know that your interest in delivering the best care for your patients sits at the heart of what we do. There is a different bandwidth available well for the industry to be on the agenda. It's been difficult for us to always get our messages out, as I've said, but we are listening. We don't always have to talk, but we're certainly listening and we will feed the information that is required for you to do your job as well as you can, whether it be in the acute care setting, in a redeployed role in the community or delivering urgent dental care. For the time being, routine dental care is not available in England, Scotland, Ireland or Wales. And I will ask you to respect that for the public health interest and our contribution to the challenge of COVID. So 1800 hours. Thank you very much. Keep safe. Keep strong. Keep well. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think 
you know, she repeated it again at the end there, that routine dental care is not available outside the local urgent uh, dental care centres. And uh, I'm sure that's not what she said at the beginning. And it wasn't what she said late. Uh, it was that was what she said later on. And it seems to me that someone's gone, has been whispering in her ear and said, actually, uh, don't give these guys an inch. You know, if you give them an inch, they'll take a mile. You can't tell them that they can do routine dental care if there's no LUDC locally or if it's overwhelmed or something because uh, because there are a number of areas where there is no LUDC and no, and certainly, I mean, as a private practitioner, I don't know how I would refer anyone into an LUDC. They, they wouldn't be interested, would they? They'd say, it's your stupid fault for working in the private sector, you know. It's what a shame you don't have all the lovely money that we've got and all the lovely um, bureaucracy, you know, the, to, give, to give you the guidelines. Anyway, that's just my initial thoughts on it. You know, by all means, if you want to comment, I'll probably turn the comments off. So, hard luck. <laughs> I'm not listening. Send an email to Sarah Hurley. All right, good night.